uh, prefetching is uh, basically Renate execution is one example of prefetching, but there are many other prefetching mechanisms, which we will hopefully get into today. But remember, in the middle, I'll ask a question, which is, do you have questions to, for the review? And if you don't have questions, then we'll continue on with the lecture. Is that fair? <laughs> so think about questions from now on. <laughs> but I guess well, let's, let's first talk about the exam. Uh, you know that the exam is this Wednesday. This is the second midterm. It's in class. Uh, come to class on time. Actually, five minutes early would be good. We can change the definition of on time. We name the definition of on time for this Wednesday only. Uh, it's going to be similar format and spirit as midterm one. And I already told you, please do homework six to prepare for the midterm. All topics we've covered so far will be included, but uh, there will be more focus uh, on material that is after midterm one. And you can, uh, you can see that uh, by looking at the uh, midterm from last semester. There are two cheat sheets allowed, so you can bring your cheat sheet from the uh, last exam, uh, as well as prepare a new one, or prepare two brand new ones, if you would like. Okay, was that useful last time, the cheat sheets? No? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I get a mixed reaction. <laughs> Wait until I go through the feedback sheet that I gave. Uh, the first question was, uh, do you want more lectures or do you want uh, more time on the assignments? And you guys were almost evenly divided, I think. <laughs> so you can fight it out. And there were a couple of people who did not answer the question. Maybe they didn't see it or they just deferred to others. OK, suggestions. Uh, I would really recommend that you solve the past midterms and finals on your own. These are all online. You can check your solutions versus the online solutions. And questions will be similar in spirit. They won't be the same questions, of course, but the spirit of the questions will be similar. And hopefully you now have a good idea of what my exams are like. Okay. And we'll have additional office hours tomorrow. The TAs will have office hours. Uh, and you can attend those. You can go over the solutions. You can find me also. Uh, although I have a very busy day tomorrow, I'll try to be available. But the solutions, if you look at the, uh, once you look at the solutions, it'll be, I think the solutions will be obvious. So I would suggest trying to solve the, uh, solve the questions first and then going over the solutions. If you go over the solutions, you'll take out the fun uh, of solving the questions, I think. There's a nice DRAM refresh question, for example, in the last uh, midterm, uh, la last uh, spring 2012 midterm. So hopefully you'll, you'll have fun with it. Okay, any questions on the midterm? Hopefully you're now thinking of what questions to ask during the second half of the lecture. OK, last lecture, we wrapped up memory interference handling techniques. Uh, remember, uh, we uh, covered how to handle memory interference in the entire memory system. And we talked about several fundamental techniques, so you should be familiar with all of them. We started memory latency tolerance techniques, and we talked about Renate execution. Hopefully, that was fun. Uh, this, is, this is a cool idea for me, of course, but this is also a cool idea for many uh, companies that are trying to implement processors that tolerate memory latencies. Uh, and we've talked about enhancements to it, how to make it efficient. Uh, and how to actually enable it to handle dependent cache misses. And that's a tough problem. And I'd encourage, encourage you to look into that. Have you guys read the paper, by the way, that I have assigned? Not yet? Hopefully you will by the time of the exam. OK, today we'll cover basics of prefetching. And maybe we'll go into more detail also. And We'll do the midterm review. Okay, just to uh, refresh your memory, we were, talk we were talking about tolerating memory latency. Memory is a big bottleneck in today's systems, and going forward, it'll become an even bigger bottleneck, as we've discussed. This is data from 2003, actually, 2002, and I've already shown you this. This is the normalized execution time of a processor averaged across a large number of workloads. And if you look at this, most of the time, the processor is waiting, and most of the time, it's waiting for memory accesses. So we designed these processors, and they're not really doing computation. They're actually waiting for data, right? which doesn't make sense if you think of it. right? This is not necessarily a good design, but that's the nature of things. And this will become more important as we go into the future, because we have a lot more data to process in existing systems. And there's several fundamental latency tolerance techniques, three of which we've covered in detail, caching, uh, 
multi-threading and out-of-order execution as well as run ahead execution, a way to get the benefits of very large window out-of-order machines without actually building those machines that can look at a large number of instructions. We, we have talked about prefetching, but never really treated it rigorously, so that's what I would like to do in this lecture. Okay, prefetching. So run ahead execution is actually a method of prefetching, right? It's, it's pre-executing the program to generate prefetches, very accurate prefetches. And we'll see methods uh, of, uh, other methods of pre-executing the program without having run ahead execution. Okay, so I'm uh, this is the outline of what I'd like to cover. This is pretty aggressive for today, I think. But let's take a look. Uh, there are actually, people have employed prefetching at many different levels, software, hardware, execution-based. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those. We'll talk about some of the basics, and we'll talk about the performance evaluation of prefetchers. And probably we will get to it, we'll talk about prefetcher throttling, which is important. How do you control? Whenever you have a speculation, speculative mechanism, you would like to control it well. So we did it with run ahead, right? We throttled run ahead if uh, we thought that it wasn't effective, right? If, it, if the period was going to be short, overlapping, or useless, we somehow predict it. We're going to do the same thing with the prefetcher. And these are very fundamental techniques, right? Prefetching is actually employed in software at the system level as well. So the computers you're running are employing prefetching. Well, I don't know about that one. That's Mac OS, but Windows aggressively employs prefetching, for example, as I discussed uh, earlier. Uh, that probably too. I mean, it just makes sense, right? If, if you can detect the patterns of the user, if you're opening up your email every day at 9 a.m., why not prefetch the email into the cache, into the buffer cache? And a lot of the operating systems do that. And the decisions are very similar at some level. There's a prefetching algorithm that governs those, but we're going to look focus into the chip level, how to do this prefetching from the, process, uh, from the memory to the processor, and as, as well as between different levels in the memory hierarchy. But hopefully the fundamentals you take away will be applicable if you go and design operating systems in the future, or distributed systems. Okay, what is the idea? The idea is very simple. Fetch the data before it's needed, or prefetch or preload, uh, before it's needed by the program. Why? Uh, the latency of fetching the data is high if we can preload it accurately and early enough, we can eliminate that latency. And if, if we're not early enough, uh, if we're a little bit late, we can at least cover some of that latency, right? If it takes 500 cycles to access memory, if we, uh, if we cut 250 of those cycles, it's still good, hopefully. Uh, the big upside of prefetching is it doesn't need to have seen the data before, meaning it's not, it's very different from caching. Caching requires to have seen the data, right? You should have loaded that data into your cache to be able to cache it. That's the, uh, that's by definition caching. Whereas prefetching can eliminate compulsory cache misses. So you don't need to have seen the addresses before. I guess, can it, can it eliminate all cache misses? Any thoughts on this? Yes. You have to fetch it at some, I, I see. I, uh, can, it, uh, can it ensure that a processor never stalls for a cache miss? Maybe I should ask it that way. Yes, <laughs> that's a better, uh, you're making me uh, ask the question more rigorously, which is good. Yes. So an incorrect prefetch by fish parser in a more complex mode uh -huh. could completely affect the instruction that maybe you're using. Uh -huh. So I don't need to prefetch after the multiple. Assuming it's not accurate, right? That's right or assuming it's too early, perhaps. Yeah. So I think the theoretical answer to this question is yes. If you actually can know everything you need to access, and if you access it right before it's needed, or early enough before it's needed, and uh, get it into your cache, or get it into some buffer in the processor, you can eliminate all cache misses. But that's very, very tough to do, right? How do you, how do you predict the future? How do you predict which data you're going to access? So people have. Uh, and you have limited cache space, limited space to buffer the prefetches as well, buffer the prefetch data. So we'll take a look at this question. But it, actually, theoretically, it can eliminate all cache misses. And if your program access pattern is nice, if you can predict it early, you can do that. Meaning, uh, it can eliminate all cache misses that cause stalls to the processor. That's the purpose. 
So this involves predicting which address will be needed in the future, obviously. And usually works if programs have predictable misaddress patterns, but we'll take a look at that. People have tried to uh, figure out more and more creative ways of figuring out what address is going to be touched by a program. And hopefully we'll get to some of the creative ways. Okay, one question. Does a pre misprediction prefetching affect correctness? You just prefetch a random a a address from memory. Does this affect correctness? No, right? Because this is all speculative, right? It's not uh, going to uh, change your program. Because, uh, well, it's not, basically, if you mispredicted the address, the data is simply not used. And there's no need for state recovery. This is very different from branch misprediction, for example. If you mispredict the branch, you'd better recover from it. Although even that assumption, I would encourage you to challenge at some point. Uh, I'll give you one example. At the high level, uh, at the algorithmic level, Maybe that branch misprediction doesn't matter right, as long as you're back on the correct path. So uh, one example, uh, if, if you have a compiler, for example, GCC, it does a lot of iterative optimization. And there are some cases where it tries to find optimizations uh, uh, in the code, but it doesn't find any optimizations. So at that point, the branches you mispredict, as long as it p eventually you get back on the correct path, may not matter, right? Because at the algorithmic level, you're tolerating uh, the misprediction. Does that make sense? If the misprediction doesn't eventually affect the program output that goes to the user, maybe, maybe it's okay. So that's, that's always good to think about. Or uh, another, another example is if, you have, uh, if you're doing machine learning, if, you're, if you have a statistical program, you're doing machine learning on a large data set, maybe it's okay if some of your data is incorrect even, right? because you're trying to mine some data and uh, find some patterns in it. If you mispredicted a branch while you're doing that learning in that program, maybe it's okay if you executed something wrong. It, it may be treated just like uh, data that's incorrect, right? It may be treated just like noise. So going into the future, it would be good to think about whether branch mispredictions actually affect correctness or uh, also at the user level. But of course, this is, uh, this is a tough task to figure out for the hardware. If the hardware doesn't have any information about uh, algorithmic, what happens algorithmically, it still needs to recover from a branch misprediction right, at the low level. OK. Uh, usually, uh, whenever I talk about prefetching in this lecture, for the rest of the lecture, I'll talk about prefetching at the cache block granularity. Because modern systems operate at the cache block granularity. And prefetching is also done at the cache block granularity. Uh, it can reduce both miss rate as well as miss latency, as I just told you. It can be done by the hardware, compiler, or the programmer. Uh, and programmer includes, I guess, any kind of programmer, including system programmer. This is one example of where, how a hardware prefetcher fits in the memory system. If you look at this memory system, we have uh, I cache and D cache, and the processor is somewhere here. And this is the L2 cache. And this is a prefetcher that looks at requests coming into the L2. Uh, that is trained using the request coming into the L2 uh, and prefetches, uh, inserts prefetches into the L2. So this is an L2 level hardware prefetcher. So uh, we'll talk about this later on, but uh, it creates an entry to track misses whenever there's an L2 cache miss. It observes L2 cache hits to see if the processor is actually going towards uh, that miss, looking at that region. It generates prefetches into the L2 request queue, which goes down. You can have a prefetcher that are at different levels, right? You can actually have a prefetcher at the memory controller level. This is, this is, a, this is a design where a memory controller is off chip. But you could actually have a prefetcher that observes the access pattern that comes here and prefetches based on that. And there are trade offs associated with that because the access pattern that's observed by the prefetches, prefetcher here is much more complete, right? It's much closer to the processor. As you go down here to the memory controller, and if you put the prefetcher here, uh, the access pattern will be filtered by the L1 caches, L2 cache, many other caches you may have in between. Uh, and uh, it will be basically the memory accesses. So it may not have the complete access pattern, which may lead to, uh, I guess I'll cover this briefly right now. 
which may lead to uh, gaps in patterns. So the processor may be doing this, A, address A, A plus 2, A plus 4, A plus 6, A plus 8. This may, go, uh, this may be the access stream observed at the data cache level. But at the memory controller level, you may get, and these are cache block addresses, remember, A plus 6, and maybe A plus 80. And maybe A plus 100. Of course, imagine this going uh, with a stride of 2. And then A plus 100, 2. So you have a very nice stride here at the data cache level. But you have absolutely no stride here, at least no predictable stride here, right? If you put the prefetcher down here. So there's a trade off immediately, right? You have the full access pattern observed by the prefetcher. And the benefit of this is you can detect the strides much better. Whereas at the downstream, if you put the prefetcher far away from the processor at the memory controller, for example, you don't have the complete access pattern. You have a filtered access pattern. And as a result, the prefetcher may not be able to figure out what the stride is because this access pattern is filtered from the caches. Right? Why is it filtered? Because the addresses that are actually requested by the processor are hidden in the caches. Right? So you have a trade-off. I guess what is the disadvantage uh, of doing this? Is there one? There's always a disadvantage right? in every design decision you make. The disadvantage here is you need a lot higher bandwidth from your prefetcher. These addresses come every cycle if you're putting it at the data cache level, for example. Whereas your prefetcher needs to have enough ports to figure, uh, figure out the stride. Whereas here, these accesses come every once in a while. So the prefetcher that you put here has a lot more time to process what's going on. OK, there are four key questions in prefetching. I guess what, when, where, and how. What to prefetch, what addresses, when to initiate a prefetch request, and where to place the prefetch data. And how, how we will look at uh, uh, a little bit later. Let's cover these three, four, uh, three, three questions first. What addresses the prefetch is very important because you don't want to prefetch useless data. And this is becoming even more important, right, as, we, as memory bandwidth is becoming more precious in multi-core processors. Prefetching useless data weights many resources, uh, memory bandwidth, cache or prefetch buffer space, energy consumption. And they could all be utilized by demand requests or more accurate prefetch requests. By generating a bad address, you're basically wasting resources. And we'll, I'll give you some data. You, act, you could actually lose performance if you generate bad addresses, if your prefetcher is not good. So accurate prediction of addresses is therefore important. And accuracy is simply defined as uh, used prefetches, number of prefetches that are used by the processor divided by sent prefetches. That's simple, right? So how do we know what to prefetch? Somehow uh, the prefetching algorithm determines what to prefetch. And we'll look at different algorithms. One algorithm is somehow predict the stride, right? Look at the past and access patterns and figure out if there's a stable stride, if there is prefetch. And that's a nice algorithm that has been employed, but existing prefetchers are more sophisticated than that. The second is when to initiate a prefetch request. If you prefetch too early, uh, prefetch data may not be used before it's evicted from storage. And we've talked about this within the context of runhead execution a little bit, right? If the runhead period is very long, if you prefetch a cache block early on, by the time you need that cache block, it may be too late. Right? If you prefetch too late, on the other hand, you may not be able to hide the whole uh, entire memory latency. So there is, a there is a balance that needs to be struck here. And that's actually a tough balance, both in hardware and software. It's a little bit easier in hardware. In software, it's harder because you don't know how uh, the scheduling uh, will happen dynamically, right? When a data item is prefetched, it affects the timeliness, of course, right? And prefetching can be made more timely by two, uh, in two ways. First, you can make it more aggressive. Uh, you can try to stay far ahead of the processor's access stream. So if you look at this access stream, 
let's say the processor, let's say the uh, prefetcher figured out that the processor has a stride of two, and the processor is currently accessing address a plus six. The pre an aggressive prefetcher, a not so aggressive prefetcher may just prefetch a plus eight. An aggressive prefetcher may actually predict that the processor is going to be on this stride for a while and prefetch the next 50 lines. This is called the prefetch distance. Prefetch distance is how far ahead is the prefetcher from the demand access stream of the processor. If the prefetcher is just one block far ahead, the distance in, in this case is, I guess, two, right? It's a, uh, or depending, depending on how you calculate the distance, it, it can be one block far ahead, right? If it actually prefetches the next 50 lines, it's 50 blocks far ahead, so the distance is large. Now you have a trade-off, right? Uh, this distance will not, uh, if the processor accesses a plus eight in the next cycle, it's already too late that the prefetcher generated this. So you may not get any benefit from a short distance. On the other hand, if the distance is too long, the processor may never get to that 50th line, right? Because the processor may, uh, depending on the program behavior, the last access that the processor does may be a plus 12, right? Now you prefetched 50 next lines, whereas the processor only needed three. So it's, it's actually an art to figure this out. Uh, in, in, in software, you could do sophisticated techniques if you're just prefetching at the system level, for example. Some systems employ sophisticated machine learning techniques to figure out when to stop and when to uh, continue. But in the hardware, it's relatively hard to implement those techniques because you're bound by the implementation complexity. Okay, where to place the prefetch data? Uh, you've seen that run-ahead execution pre uh, place the prefetch data into the cache, right? And that's a common solution. The upside is it's a simple design, no need for separate buffers, right? Uh, the downside is this can evict useful demand data, right? Because cache also caches uh, the data that, you, uh, that the processor uh, asked for, demanded. So it could lead to cache pollution. This is called cache pollution. Your cache is polluted by prefetches that are speculative. Uh, alternatively, to eliminate cache pollution, you can prefetch uh, the data in a separate prefetch buffer. This is essentially another structure, right, a table. It could be organized just like a cache, except it holds just the prefetched blocks. I guess the upside is demand data is now predicted from the prefetches, right? You have no cache pollution. But there are actually quite a few downsides to this. I'm giving you all of this. Uh, but hopefully you, this, you're familiar with, you, you should be familiar with the trade-offs related to this. Uh, this leads to more complex system design, right? Whenever you have a buffer, additional buffer, your complexity increases. A memory system is already very complex. And there's, there, there are many questions, of course. Where do you place the prefetch buffer? Do you prefetch it, uh, do you place it next to the data cache? And if you do that, then this is your L1 data cache, and this is your prefetch buffer. How do you access it, serially or in parallel, right? You have all these different questions that you need to answer. Uh, when do you move the data from the prefetch buffer to the cache? When a, when a uh, request hits in the prefetch buffer, normally a good, idea, uh, a good idea might be to move that data to the cache. But you may decide to keep it there. Now it's, it's, it's not only, only a prefetch buffer, but it's also a cache now, right? Uh, how to size it? If the prefetch buffer is actually small and you're doing aggressive prefetching, this may need to be very large size. In the paper you're reading, uh, the feedback directed prefetcher paper that I've assigned, a small prefetch buffer doesn't help performance. In fact, it hurts performance. Why? Because uh, let's, say you, let's say you're prefetching into the L2 level. You have this L2 cache. Uh, that's four megabytes. And one option is actually to prefetch into the L2 cache. Now you have the entire four megabytes to prefetch into, which is relatively large. If you add a prefetch buffer of 64 kilobytes, and if you're doing aggressive prefetching, this may not be enough. Prefetches just go into this buffer of 64 kilobytes. Right? And they may not be used by the time the processor actually needs them. So sizing of this is an issue. If you actually prefetch into the cache, now you, have the, you, don't, you don't have to make that choice. Right? Uh, the last thing is keeping the prefetch buffer coherent. Right? 
whenever you add a more structure, uh, another structure into the memory hierarchy, we haven't covered cache coherence, but you know the basic idea. The basic idea is if you have two processors and they both have caches, uh, you need to keep the same address, the data belonging to the same address coherent. If one processor writes to address A, uh, 1000, the other processor should get the latest updated value of address A. It shouldn't get zero here, which is an old copy. Now the same thing exists in the prefetch buffer, right? If you had a prefetch buffer, you have a prefetch buffer here, you have a prefetch buffer here, and you need to ensure that whatever data that's brought here, uh, let's say you prefetch address B, and this processor writes in its cache to address B some value uh, that's 1,000, and the prefetched value of B was 0, you need to ensure that whenever this processor needs this block B, it gets the updated value. So you need to have cache coherence in the prefetch buffer. And new structures, whenever you add a new structure like this in the memory system, you increase complexity. OK. So because of these reasons, actually, Many processors, many modern systems today place the prefetch data into the cache. Their hardware and software prefetchers usually, actually, almost all the systems I know of prefetch the data into the cache. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering, is it common to have a prefetch buffer for something that doesn't exist separately, or is there a specific block in the cache? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, to, uh, for a prefetch buffer, you said. Uh, well, usually prefetch buffers don't exist today. Uh, so usually, Data is prefetched into the cache, so you don't need to make that decision. So would you prefetch for a particular data type separately, or? Oh, uh, I see. Uh, different prefetchers, you're saying. So actually, th yes, uh, data and instruction cache prefetchers can be separate in existing systems. Because the instruction cache, uh, usually instruction access patterns are much more predictable than data access patterns. So sequential prefetchers, like next line prefetchers, work quite well. And in fact, instruction prefetching is a little bit different. We will not necessarily cover that, but what you can do is you can uh, use your branch predictor to figure out what cache uh, lines you're going to access in the future. So what some of the existing systems do is they decouple the fetch engine from the rest of the processor. This is called decoupled fetch. What they do is you have this iCache, and you have the branch predictor, branch prediction structures. And you have a buffer of instructions, instruction buffer. And what you can do is, even though the back end may be stalled, let's say this is the back end. Uh, after this, you have decoder uh, and rename logic, and etc. Even if this part is stalled, if you have long enough of a buffer, the front end can keep running ahead, right? How? Basically. You can have a loop here that indexes into the branch predictor. The branch predictor provides the next program counter. And next program counter is fed into the iCache, and you prefetch the next line. Right. And you could keep doing that regardless of what's happening in the back end. Right. Well, at some point, back end will tell you that your branch prediction is wrong, and then you flush the buffer. Right. So this decoupled fetch is employed in uh, many systems today. IBM System Z is one of them, for example. So you could think of this as an instruction prefetcher, right? What's happening is you're using the branch prediction information to prefetch into the iCache and fill the instructions. OK? OK. But even that is prefetching into the cache, as you can see here. You could alternatively have another prefetch buffer. That does complicate the front end design now. OK, which level of cache to prefetch it to? This is another design decision. And again, there is no correct answer. This is a tough decision. Do you pre uh, prefetch from memory to L2 or memory to directly L1? Most prefetchers today actually don't directly prefetch from memory into the L1. They prefetch from memory to a bigger cache. Why? Because they don't want to cause cache pollution in the L at the L1 level, because L1 is relatively small. Whereas at the L2 level, which is large, pollution is still an issue, right? But at least it's more tolerable at this level. Uh, but some systems actually have separate prefetchers at, at different levels. So Intel Core, uh, for example, used to have an L2 to L1 prefetcher, which is separate from memory to L2 prefetcher. Some AMD systems used to have 
a prefetcher at the memory controller as well as a prefetcher at the L2 level. The benefit of having different prefetchers at different levels is you can actually customize a prefetcher. So for example, a prefetcher at the memory controller has an advantage. It knows what row buffer is open, right? It can actually prefetch from that open row buffer to maximize bandwidth. And that's what exactly uh, AMD's prefetcher did. It prefetched from the open row buffer, predicting the patterns. You cannot do that if your prefetcher is sitting at the data cache, right? You have no idea which row is open and which bank. You don't even know which bank is, how many banks there are in memory, right? OK. So where do you place the prefetch data in the cache is another question, right? Do you treat prefetch blocks the same as demand fetch blocks? Is that a good idea? Maybe, maybe not, right? Again, the idea, the question, uh, the, it depends. Uh, but prefetch blocks, you, you don't know that they're going to be used. Right? With, with least recently used policy, a demand block is placed into the most recently used po position, right, whenever you fetch it. Do you want to do the same thing for a prefetch? Not necessarily true, right? And we'll see how we can, uh, well, I don't know if we will see. But one, one option is to pre predict the accuracy of your prefetcher, and based on that, decide where to insert your prefetch. If the processor thinks the prefetcher is very accurate, then the prefetch may be inserted at the MRU position such that it stays in the cache for a long time. If the processor thinks the prefetcher may not be that accurate, then the prefetch may be inserted into the LRU position. Because if you insert it into the LRU position in the cache, least recently used position, remember this is, think of this as a four-way cache. If you insert a block into the MRU position, it'll stay in the cache much longer, right? Whereas if you insert the block into the LRU position, the first demand or the first requests that comes into the cache and that misses will evict this block, assuming you use an LRU policy. So you limit the damage caused by an inaccurate prefetch by inserting the prefetch at a low priority position in your set associative cache. And actually, there were some pre uh, processors, I believe this was HP uh, PA processors, that prefetched always just into the LRU position. So they never trusted their prefetcher, I assume. You had only one way to prefetch into, into the cache. Yes? But then if your prefetch always prefetch one memory access too early, mm -hmm. then you will always be on a disk. That's right. You can get into cases uh, where uh, your prefetches are going to the LRU position and the demand access uh, evicts that block. But remember that this is just for one set, so you have a lot of sets. So if, you're a, if you have a streaming prefetcher, it'll be, uh, it'll be putting blocks into this set net first, and then the next set, and then the next set, and then the next set in the cache. But you could certainly, you, have, you, have, you still have less space in your cache and low priority. Okay. I think I already talked about this. OK, where to place the hardware prefetcher in the memory hierarchy? I think we've talked about this uh, a little bit. Uh, what access patterns does the prefetcher see? Seeing a more comp complete access pattern, as I showed here, potentially enables better accuracy, right? And better coverage also. Coverage is uh, how many of the cache misses that would have been seen by the processor are actually prefetched by the prefetcher. Ideally, you would like 100% co coverage. You don't want to see any misses as a demand, right? And you can get better coverage by looking at a complete access stream like this. If you, whereas if you look at this, obviously your coverage is not going to be very high, right? Uh, the downside is prefetcher needs to examine more requests here. Right? And we've talked about this. Now let's uh, look into how. Uh, how is perhaps the most fun part because, uh, well, actually, all of these design decisions are complicated, but this is perhaps the most complicated one because you need to have an algorithm to determine what to prefetch, right? So software prefetching, uh, in this case, the ISA provide prefetch instructions. And I'll show you some examples. Uh, the programmer or compiler inserts prefetch instructions. This requires some effort. And usually this works well for regular access patterns. There's hardware prefetching. In this case, the hardware automatically monitors processor accesses and memorizes or finds patterns or strides and generates these prefetch addresses automatically. Again, this is a choice between programmer versus microarchitect, right? Here, it's the programmer's burden to do the prefetching to tolerate the latency. 
Here it's the hardware, microarchitect's burden to do it. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. There is also execution-based prefetches. I did not categorize this as software or hardware because this could actually be done in software and hardware also. But the idea here is to have a separate thread uh, in addition to the main program uh, to prefetch data for the main program. Uh, this can be generated by either software programmer or the hardware dynamically. Uh, and you could think of run-ahead execution. Remember run-ahead execution when you get to a, a, a long latency cache miss, checkpoint the architectural state and keep processing. And uh, when the cache miss returns, go back to the checkpoint and re-execute the program. You could think of run-ahead execution as a context switch to a thread that does prefetching, right? Except the thread is the main program, right? Why do I call it a context switch? Because you're actually checkpointing the architectural state and you're actually going back to that checkpoint. Right? You could think of run at execution as a thread-based prefetcher, except the thread is already there, which is the main program. So usually when we talk about execution-based or thread-based prefetchers, somebody generates a separate thread. And we will talk about that. Actually, let me give you the basic idea. The basic idea is, for example, well, let's say you have a program. You have add, multiply, divide, dot, 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 and then a load. And you have a bunch of other instructions here. Let's say this is the dependence chain that goes into this load. And this load is predicted to be a cache miss. You somehow figured out this will be a cache miss. What the compiler can do is uh, it can figure out which instructions actually contribute to the execution of this load. And let's say you have other instructions here. And the compiler can take out those instructions and pack it into a separate thread. Let's call this the prefetch thread or helper thread, which is helping the execution of the program. And compiler can insert an instruction here saying uh, something like launch prefetch thread. X, let's say. Maybe this is thread X. Now when the main program gets to this launch prefetch thread instruction, this thread that was generated by the compiler that only computes the data that's needed to generate the address for the load gets launched on a separate thread context. Make sense? This is where a multi-threaded processor can be useful also to improve the performance of, a, of this main program. Or you could launch this thread in a separate core also separate processor. And there are trade-offs associated with that, which we may get into. But that's the idea. Somebody, in this case a compiler, generates a thread that uh, consists of instructions that lead to the generation of the address of this load instruction, that lead to the execution of this load instruction. That thread is packaged and launched early enough such that it's executed together with the main program here. While the main program is executing, this thread is also executing. Hopefully this thread will get to the same load much earlier than the main program. And this load will generate a cache miss. And by the time the main program gets, gets to the same load, uh, this, the data that's needed is already in the cache. That's the idea. It's fun, right? <laughs> of course, the, uh, you need a separate thread context to be able to accomplish that. OK, let's look at uh, software prefetching. The idea is to have the compiler, programmer, place prefetch instruction into appropriate place in the code. And I've given you one paper to look at. This is actually Todd Maury's PhD thesis, who's in the CS department. Uh, prefetch instructions can prefetch data into caches or other places again. Uh, and you can actually have different people insert these. But I'll give you an example of the x86 prefetch instruction. This is from an older version of x86. And it'll point out uh, one of some of the downsides of it as well. If you look at it, there are several flavors of prefetch instruction in x86. Prefetch t0, t1, t2, and t8. And this denotes the temporal locality. t0 says prefetch data into all levels of the cache hierarchy. And it's actually dependent on the microarchitecture, the specification itself. For example, it says Pentium 3 processor, it goes to the first or second level cache. They don't even commit to which cache it, it goes into. 
uh, and Pentium 4 and Intel Xeon processor, this uh, prefetch instruction prefetches into the second level cache. And if you actually look at uh, these prefetch instructions, they're all very similar. <laughs> so that's, uh, uh, that's uh, software prefetching. The specification is usually not very exact. In fact, if you look at the hardware design, because these instructions are speculative, they could be dropped, right? So let's say you have a prefetch instruction in your program, and that generates a cache miss. Well, you don't have a buffer to handle that cache miss in the hardware. What do you do? Hardware designer can decide to drop that instruction. So you may not be guaranteed to get the performance that you would like to get when you insert prefetch instructions. Okay, so how do you do this? Like, how do you insert prefetch instructions? This is one example. For example, this is a regular access pattern. Uh, you're going through two arrays and summing them up. Uh, well, I guess you're, you're summing up two arrays uh, to a running sum. And you have a nice access pattern. This is prefetching eight iterations ahead, right? And this can work for very regular array-based access patterns. I'm going through this relatively fast because I think you're, you're all familiar with these patterns, right? We've covered this in vector processing, for example. Vector processors essentially can do something like this also. So what are the issues? Uh, you need additional prefetch instructions. That's one downside compared to hardware-based prefetching. Uh, and these take up processing and execution bandwidth. Uh, so the upside is this can work very well for regular patterns. Actually, if all you're doing is this in your program, inserting prefetch instructions at, nice pl at good places can ensure that the processor never stalls for a demand access. Of course, you need to somehow find out what the value of this uh, eight should be, right? How many iterations ahead uh, should uh, these prefetches uh, prefetch? Determining that is actually difficult. Because the prefetch distance, which is, in this case, it's determined to be eight, but it may not be eight. It depends on the hardware implementation, right? What is the memory latency? What is the cache size? What is the time between the loop iterations? How much work is done in this loop? Uh, and also other things. Is there memory interference from other processors? Right. Now you have a tough decision to make at compile time because you have no idea what other applications will run with this program. That's one of the uh, reasons we want predictable performance from these systems. But uh, because these decisions are very difficult to know statically, uh, the code that's eventually generated will become not very portable. So you need to recompile your code when you actually uh, change the system you're running the code on. Uh, so if you actually go too far back, uh, for example, if you decide, uh, if you, you want to prefetch a thousand iterations ahead, right, you may never get to uh, that a thousand iterations ahead, right? The code may never get to that because this n may be smaller. So that reduces the accuracy because there may be branches in between that is executed. So the compiler also has a choice of determining the prefetch distance. And it's very similar to the hardware choice, hardware's choice, but uh, it's different or it's more difficult because the compiler has no uh, feedback from the hard, uh, feedback as to what the latencies are in the system. So if you have a load, do you insert the prefetch here or do you insert the prefetch much high up? If you go much high up, there may be a branch here uh, you've generated the prefetch, but the branch will branch away from the load that will actually use that prefetch. Right? That's the fundamental uh, problem at the, uh, at the compiler level. But again, this happens when you don't have a regular access pattern. Okay, you need a special prefetch instructions in the ISA, but you can overcome this. For example, in alpha, uh, a load into register 31 was treated as a prefetch instruction. Why? Because register 31 was hardwired to zero. Whereas other ISAs, like PowerPC, had data cache block touch instruction, which is a separate prefetch instruction. This is, uh, in general, prefetching for pointer-based data structures is hard, linked data structures. Uh, but it's, it's even harder with software prefetching, unless you do thread-based uh, prefetching. So let's take a look at this example. 
I guess uh, you're, you're, uh, we're, we're uh, traversing a linked list in this case. You have this pointer, uh, and pointer will become pointer next. And while P, you're doing this, and you're doing some work on the data uh, of that linked list. In this case, you can prefetch uh, the next, uh, next node in the list, right? But I guess if I visualize this. We'll have something like this. While you're operating on this, you can prefetch p next. You can prefetch one iteration ahead. Right. That's what that program is doing. Now that's good if 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 you have enough work to do while you're doing the work, which is that work part. If you can overlap this work with the latency of prefetching the next node, this is great. But what if the latency of prefetching the next node is so high that, and you have little work? Then you need to prefetch much farther ahead, right? While you're actually operating on this node, you want to prefetch n nodes ahead. Does that make sense? And when you move to the next node, you'll prefetch n node ahead also. When you move to the next node, you'll prefetch n node ahead. Now, how do you get to that n node ahead? Well, you could do this, right? You prefetch p next, next, next. In this case, uh, while you're operating here, you're actually prefetching next, next, next. Is there something wrong with this? Yes? How do you know what the end is? How do you, how do you know about the end? Oh, whether you're out of the list? Oh, how do, you, how do you actually, yeah, how do you figure that out? Yeah, that's a tough problem also. But uh, like how far ahead uh, you should prefetch, how many nodes ahead you should prefetch is a tough problem because it depends on how much work you have and what your memory latency is, right? Let's say your memory latency is uh, 500 cycles and each iteration take 100 cycles. Your n should be roughly 5. Because while you're uh, accessing for memory for 500 cycles, you should be doing five iterations. And by the time you're done with those iterations, uh, your data is there. So that's, that's a separate question. But there's something else wrong with this. Yes? So to know uh, so much ahead, you should have had, had all these in cache before that. That's right, exactly. And if you had all those in cache, why are you prefetching? Right? So that's the dependence problem, right? That's the, uh, you cannot do this, basically. Why? Because you need to do a p next, next, next. And in order to be able to prefetch that, they, they all need to be in the cache. And this contradicts your <laughs> the prefetching, basically. And if they're not in the cache, now you stall, right? So you're generating these prefetches and stalling because you need to get, get to next, next, next. You'll get a cache miss here, but you cannot get to next because the next is inside that cache block. So you're back to square one, basically, because you were going to stall anyway. So this is not, uh, well, I guess which one is better? Uh, this one is better, obviously, because you don't need to stall in this case. You can generate the prefetch request, but it may not cover the latency. Ideally, you would like this one, uh, but you cannot do this. Then the question is, how do you do this? Any ideas in software? I'll give you one idea. This is. Do you guys know about skip lists? Yes? So you could actually use skip lists to do this, right? So in addition to having pointers to the next node in each node, let's do this. Let's say we want to prefetch four nodes ahead. In addition to having pointers to the next node, also have pointers to the fourth next node. Of course, you need to change your software to do that. And you could imagine everyone has those pointers, right? This goes to this, this goes to this, this goes to this, dot, dot, dot. Basically, let's call this the jump pointer. <laughs> when you're accessing this node, prefetch using this additional pointer, jump pointer, four nodes ahead. 
when you're accessing this node, prefetch again four nodes ahead. That's the idea. So this requires a storage of extra pointers in software, however. That's the downside. The upside is now you can prefetch much farther ahead because you have these additional pointers. You don't need to determine the address of fourth next node by going through this dependence chain. That address is already stored. But now you need to manage these pointers in software also. It's already hard to manage the linked data structures in software. If you have many, many other pointers, you'll need to manage more. So there are potential ways of overcoming this, but this is a tough problem. I guess there's another problem. Uh, you may not have pointers to every node, right? <laughs> Usually when you have a skip list, you have an additional skip pointer. But this may not be enough to cover your latency. Now do you start having many, many pointers? That becomes uh, very complex. So it's tough to do. I guess we've covered this. Uh, well, I guess maybe not exactly covered this, but you could prefetch for every load access, but this is too bandwidth intensive. Uh, so many compilers profile the code and determine the loads that are likely to miss. And again, uh, we've covered uh, profile input set representativeness. If your profile input set is not representative, you may be inserting prefetches at places you may not want to insert them. So a key question is how far ahead before the miss should the prefetch be inserted? Uh, and uh, the profile uh, can uh, enable you to determine the probability of use for various prefetch distances from the miss. So you could actually have a load instruction. Now you have uh, a choice. Do you insert the prefetch here? Do you insert it earlier in the program? Do you insert it even earlier? Again, based on the profile results, you can figure out where the branches go here. right? If you actually do static code optimizations that we've discussed earlier, the super block optimizations, for example, hyperblocks, now you have a better idea of what's the frequently executed path. Right? So those optimizations help prefetching as well, because the compiler gets a good idea of the block that the processor is going to execute. And if this block remains stable, it can make a much better decision of where to insert the prefetch instruction. But again, all of those optimizations depend on profile input sets representativeness. Right? And usually, the compiler needs to insert a prefetch far in advance to cover hundreds of cycles of main memory latency, which leads to reduced accuracy. Okay. So hardware prefetching, I've well, already given you the basic idea, right? Specialized hardware observes load store access path. I guess before we uh, complete this, compilers actually do prefetching. Uh, and uh, if you look at GCs, there are prefetching options. And these options work very well for regular access patterns. In fact, you can do your own prefetching for regular access patterns, right? If you're, if you're doing matrix blocking, for example, you can preload the block. You can have two loops. One loop actually preloads, and the, loop, the second loop actually does the work. You can peel the loops, right? You can have uh, two loops to do that. And you can pipeline the loops nicely such that while you're doing work, you're prefetching for the next block, uh, next uh, matrix block. Is this clear? OK. So you can answer a question on the exam on matrix blocking if it comes up. <laughs> OK. Uh, so, uh, but for irregular access patterns, uh, it's tough to do. So specialized hardware is usually used to observe load store access patterns and prefetch data based on this past access behavior. The upside, the big upside of hardware prefetching is it, it can be tuned to the implementation of the system, right? The hardware designer knows what are the latencies, what is the cache size. And you can now tune your prefetcher to all of, the, all of that information uh, that you know. It doesn't waste instruction execution bandwidth. Right? So you, you don't actually stress the processor resources. The downside is now you have more hardware complexity, of course. Uh, and software can be more efficient in some cases. For example, striding patterns. Even though hardware is still efficient, it still requires some detection logic for that. So uh, I'll cover a bunch of prefetchers very quickly. Some of these are really, very simple. Next line prefetcher is, for example, is the simplest form of hardware prefetching. It's been employed since the 1970s. Actually, in the 1960s, uh, IBM 3691. Uh, remember, that was one of the first out-of-order execution processors where Tomoslo's algorithm was implemented. 
they had an instruction prefetch buffer that essentially did next line prefetching. And basically, the idea is to always prefetch next and cache lines after a demand access or a demand miss. It's also called the next sequential prefetcher. Simple to implement, no need for a pattern detection at all, right? You always prefetch the next n access uh, n cache lines. And it works well uh, for st streaming access patterns, instructions. Of course, when you have an irregular access pattern, you can wa waste bandwidth, right? And even with regular patterns, if you have a stride of two, and if your n is one, if you always prefetch the next cache line, what is your prefetch accuracy? Any guesses? Your stride is uh, whatever I showed here. It happened to be two over here also. A, A plus two, A plus four, A plus six, A plus eight. And you're always prefetching only the next line. Zero percent, right? Because with A, you're prefetching A plus one. With A plus two, you're prefetching A plus three. With A plus four, you're prefetching A plus five. Zero percent. That's terrible. If you're prefetching the next two lines, your prefetch accuracy is 50 percent. Right? Even that's a bad prefetch accuracy. Uh, and there are other issues uh, that you can figure out if you think about it a little bit. What if the program is traversing from higher to lower addresses instead of lower to higher addresses in this case? So you somehow need to determine the direction. And this is actually a real issue that uh, existing prefetchers handle in hardware. And do you also prefetch the previous end cache lines? Uh, once you determine the direction of the access stream, you can handle this much better. Stride prefetchers are a little bit more sophisticated, and they're actually uh, used as, uh, they have two kinds. One is program counter based, and the other is cache block address based. The idea is to record the distance between the memory addresses referenced by a load instruction, if it's the program counter based, uh, as well as the last address referenced by the load. And the next time you see the same load instruction, prefetch last address plus stride. That's pretty simple, right? Assume that this is generated by the same load instruction. You record the distance between the last two addresses as well as the last address. Let's say these are the last two addresses, A, A plus 2. The stride is 2. And whenever you fetch the load instruction again, uh, the processor takes the last address as the stride, which is 2 to it, and prefetches A plus 4. So you can, do, you can design a very simple logic to do this. And this is the logic. I will not go into detail. You have the program counter of the load instruction. For each program counter, you have the last address reference, last stride, and some confidence value. And confidence means how confident is the processor on the stride. It usually indicates how many times in the recent past that stride was seen. So the first time you see this plus 2 stride, you bump up the confidence. In this case, the next time you see this plus two stride, you bump up the confidence again. Next time, you bump up the confidence. So now our confidence is three. Right? And maybe you have a threshold saying, oh, don't start prefetching until the confidence is three, until I've seen the same stride three times in a row. And when you, uh, if, if, for example, you've seen it three times in a row, and the next access is to A plus 80, now your stride doesn't hold, right? It's the, the stride is not the same. so you. Uh, change the stride and set the confidence counter to zero. Well, if you do it this way, getting far ahead may be difficult, right? Because you just take the last address and add the stride to it the next time you see the load instruction. But by the time you see the load instruction, it may be too late, right? Because you're fetching the load instruction. Maybe 10 cycles later, that load will be executed. It'll be in the execution stage. But the memory latency is 500 cycles. You should really be going ahead 50 times. So how do you fix that problem? Uh, well, I, I already told you this. Uh, you can prefetch ahead, right? You can actually do this. You can actually do last address plus n times a stride. And this n is your prefetch distance now. Then you get into how do you actually determine that n? Well, that's part of the art. You can do other, other uh, solutions also, but I will not go into those details. But prefetching ahead, basically those, uh, well, I guess look at PC. Uh, what you can do is you can do what I described over here to you. Your front end is running ahead. And it's generating a stream of program counters that will be 
seen in the future, assuming you stay in this program path that's dictated by the branch predictor. And you can use this program counter to index that table also to do data prefetching, right? This is the uh, stride prefetcher. Now if you do this, now you're using the look ahead PC because your program counter is running ahead, if you will. You're not cha your program counter is because uh, pre prefetching for the iCache as well as you're using it to index the stride prefetcher. So that's one other way to get ahead of the program access stream. And you could generate multiple prefetches as well, which is actually the same as almost uh, similar to this one. Okay, so this is program counter based. This is actually employed in some processors. You could also do stride based prefetching just purely based on memory address without looking at the program counter. And uh, the idea is basically you just take the last address and the previous address and figure out a stride. So if you're doing A, A plus N, A plus two N, A plus three N, your stride is N, right? Now you don't have the program counter. So you could do this at any level in the memory system, even if you don't have access to the program counter. Uh, so what is the upside of this? Well, you may not have uh, strides within a program counter, but you may have a stride that's seen by the memory system. For example, one program counter may be accessing A, uh, A plus 3N, A plus 9N, and there may be no stride in it, but another program counter may be accessing A plus N, A plus 2N, A plus 5N, dot, dot, dot. And when you put them together, you have a nice stride, <laughs> even though each instruction has no stride at all. That's certainly possible. Now you can detect that just by looking at the memory access stream or cache block addresses instead of, uh, instead of uh, identifying cache blocks based on the program counter. It can go the other way also, actually. You may not get a good stride. Uh, well, I guess if you, if you actually have a program counter, you can, you can get the stride. Okay, stream buffers are actually a special case of this. Uh, and I didn't assign this paper, but I recommend you read it. It's one of the uh, seminal papers that I'll describe you in the next slide. Uh, basically, the idea is to have a stride of one. This is a special case. You don't need to detect the stride. A streaming access pattern is usually an access pattern where your stride is one. So if you look at this, uh, that's the idea, stream buffers. You have this data cache, and you have a bunch of FIFOs which are prefetch buffers, and each stream buffer holds one stream of sequentially prefetched cache lines. For example, this holds A, A plus one, A plus two, dot, dot, dot. B, B plus one, B plus two, dot, dot, dot. C, C plus one, C plus two, dot, dot, dot. On a load miss from the data cache, uh, the logic, stream buffer logic, checks the head of all stream buffers to see if that address is present. If the address is present, it pops the entry from the FIFO and prefetches the next cache line in that FIFO. So if the address is A, you get the data for A, and let's say this is eight entry deep, you prefetch address A plus nine, right? So you stream in an array. So you can imagine now, uh, let's say you're adding two arrays, A and B, you could be streaming in all of the data coming from A into this FIFO and coming from B into this FIFO, and the processor never sees a miss if the stream buffer is running ahead. It's simple and nice. Uh, so if, if there's no hits, then the, uh, the logic allocates a new stream buffer to the new miss address. And you can, you, can uh, you, can, you can imagine different policies here. Uh, and uh, in that particular paper, these FIFOs are, if a FIFO is not full, uh, logic continuously prefetches into the FIFO such that you can keep it full. So this is the look ahead of the stream buffer. If this is eight entries, uh, the stream, stream uh, prefetcher is running eight uh, entries ahead of the processor's demand access stream. And you could actually do optimizations. For example, if the bus is not busy, uh, the, pro, uh, the stream buffer logic can generate a prefetch for one of the stream buffers here. And this is the logic. I'll not go into this in detail, but you can imagine this is very simple. Another way of looking at it. These are all from the paper. I guess let me cover this also and then uh, we'll, uh, I'll stop and ask you questions.
performance of the prefetcher, I've already given you this actually, accuracy, use prefetchers divided by sent prefetchers, coverage, how many of the misses generated by the program are actually prefetched. There's also timeliness, which we had never formally defined, but the idea, and it's actually, actually not that easy to formally define, I think, uh, how many of the used prefetches were on time? Well, on time is tough because you may actually cover some of the latency, right? If you have a very strict definition of timeliness, on time means the data that you need to access is in cache. You don't need to wait for it at all. Right? Usually, you cannot get all of them in a prefetcher. Right? And some of these uh, oppose each other, right? If you want to increase coverage, for example, you would like to prefetch farther ahead. And that reduces your accuracy, very likely. Not always, but very, very likely. Because once you prefetch farther ahead, the processor may never get to that farther ahead. Right? Uh, if you want to increase timeliness, again, you want to prefetch farther ahead to cover the latency. But that also reduces your accuracy. Right? If you want to be accurate, you would like to pick what you prefetch. That reduces your coverage and maybe timeliness. There are a couple of other metrics that we use to look at prefetch performance. Bandwidth consumption. So if you look at run ahead, actually, uh, this is, uh, uh, let's, let's consider run ahead execution. It has very high accuracy because it follows the program path. But its coverage is relatively low. Why? Because you're actually prefetching only when a miss happens. Right? And that miss may not always happen. So you're not prefetching beforehand. Timeliness, uh, that actually is debatable. <laughs> because you're, uh, it's not clear, right, what the timeliness of run is, because that depends on the memory latency. And that depends on when you generate the next cache miss during the run ahead period. So I'll let you think about how you would evaluate run ahead execution with this. But it, with run ahead execution, there is a trade off here also. Your accuracy is high, very, very high. But your coverage and timeliness can be issues. Bandwidth consumption, this is the memory bandwidth consumed with the prefetcher divided by memory bandwidth consumed without the prefetcher. And you can look at bandwidth at different levels, right? L1, L2, L3. Uh, the good news with prefetching is you can actually try to utilize idle ba bus bandwidth if available. If you have idle bandwidth, maybe generate a prefetch request, right? And this is uh, an important metric going forward again because this will become a, a much, uh, much more important resource in systems. It's already a very important resource. Many systems are bandwidth limited. And finally, cache pollution. These are the extra demand misses due to prefetches placed into the cache. This is a little bit more difficult to quantify, but it does affect performance. OK. I guess let me stop here and see if you guys have any questions, or if you've thought of any. Yes? Page coloring, OK, sure. Page coloring, uh, so the basic idea of page coloring is the operating system has control uh, as to where in a cache uh, a, a process's data can go to. How? Because the operating system has control over the virtual address to physical address translation, right? Uh, remember, this is the page offset. And this, these bits do not change during translation. And let's say these are uh, 12 bits. An operating system has control over this virtual, frame, uh, virtual page number to physical frame number translation. Now, page coloring means that, uh, for example, uh, I guess uh, let me give you a context. Probably you're asking this within the context of indexing into the cache, right? Virtually indexed, physically tagged caches. There are many other contexts in which this can be used, but if you have a virtually indexed, physically tagged cache, uh, one of the issues is well, let's, let's reinterpret this virtual address as your cache address. Or maybe I'll do, the, do it here. You would like to index your cache with the virtual address. 
so that you can start the cache at, at access, right? And you can do the cache access in parallel with the TLB access. And your index, some of your index bits actually come from uh, the, virtu uh, the virtual page number. Right? Let's, let's say that, I guess let's, I've already drawn this, so let's say two of your index bits come from the virtual page number. Now this causes problems with synonym and synonyms and homonyms. Well, the synonym uh, problem. A virtual address, a physical address may be present in multiple locations in the cache right? if this index is not controlled. Do you guys remember that? So so? OK. I guess I'll, I will assume that you know that. So the problem is a physical address can go to multiple locations in the cache because uh, this physical address may be mapped to multiple different virtual addresses. Right? So the idea, let's say you have two bits coming from this index. Let's say we have, we have a virtual address. Uh, actually, let me make this simpler. You have a virtual address. Let's, let's assume that this is one bit. You have virtual address 100 zero, zero and 0, zero uh, well, let's assume a virtual address 100. Uh, zero, zero. Wait a second. So the problem is you have a physical, uh, I had a good example here, but I forgot it. Uh, well, during this translation, this, these index bits may change, right? And what may happen is this virtual address uh, that is at 0, 0 may get mapped to multiple different locations in the cache. Right? So for example, a physical address uh, that has a 0, 0, let's say uh, your physical address is one zero zero, and you have two virtual addresses that map to this. One zero zero, one zero one. Right. The idea of page coloring is to ensure that this doesn't happen. Does that make sense? So you have one zero zero. and 101 that map to the same physical address. And this happens because these index bits change during translation. Right? You have an address that has index bits 00, zero a 01 that can map to a location 00. Now if you ensure that these bits never change during translation, now you can get rid of this. Right? You can never have a situation where a virtual address 100, or in this case 101, maps to 100. I don't know if this made sense. OK, let's take a, a look at it again. You have, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at a virtual uh, page uh, here. The issue, the issue is uh, a physical address can map to multiple virtual addresses. And you can eliminate that by actually ensuring that these bits do not change. Why does it map to multiple virtual addresses or multiple different locations in the cache? Because these index bits can change during that translation. In this case, if your physical address is 100, zero, zero, uh, it could actually be one uh, virtual address 100, zero, zero, 101, 110, zero, and 111 can map here. And these are the index bits. Now by ensuring that these index bits do not change during the translation, you eliminate these possibilities of uh, these virtual addresses mapping to this physical address. And how do you ensure that? Well, the operating system has control over virtual page number 
to a physical frame number allocations. The operating system says the bottom n bits, in this case 2 bits, of the virtual page number should be the same as bottom n bits of the physical frame number. Does that make sense? That way you can never get into the situation where a physical address is present in multiple different indices because the operating system didn't allow that. That's the idea. Is that clear? Yeah, there was a, um, a problem in one of the old 740 okay. midterms that were basically asking, like, how do you guarantee, given a cache that has such and such associativity and such and such block size, how do you guarantee that page color will work for that? Would you be able to? OK, sure. Which one? Should I pull it up? Oh, I'm, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe good to go over the concrete question. Let's see. But <laughs> so you could use that mechanism to partition the caches. So this problem, I'll, I guess I'll go over it quickly. Suppose we have a system with 32 cores that are sharing a physical second level cache. Assume each core is running a single, single threaded application. And all 32 cores are concurrently running applications. Assume that the page size of the architecture is 8 kilobyte. The block size of the cache is 828 bytes. And the cache is the LRU placement. We would like to ensure each application gets a dedicated amount of cache space in this shared cache without interference from other cores. We would like to enforce this using the OS-based page coloring mechanism to partition the cache, which we discussed in the lecture. Basically, the operating system ensures using virtual memory mechanism that the applications do not contend for the same space in the cache. Does that make sense? So I think, do you want to go over the entire question? I mean, maybe or just like part A or something. OK. So, well, we do this. I don't know what happened there. Okay. So the basic idea here is uh, so if you look at this you have an index coming into your cache, right? If you ensure that different applications are allocated different colors, they don't content in the cache uh, 
uh, for the same indices. That's the idea here. But we have not covered this. I can go, go through the question, okay. but. <laughs> I mean, it just seemed like the kind of thing that, you know, it's, it's fine. Yeah, if, if, yeah, we, I mean, are going to have to know. Yeah, we have not covered the multi core cache partition. Any, any other questions? If there are no other questions, I'll take it and I'll go, go with this. But if you have questions on material we covered, I'd, like, I'd prefer to prioritize that. Yes, <laughs> you have more. <laughs> You're the only one who studied. <laughs> uh, could you talk just a bit about like, a vector chain? OK, so that's something we've. Uh, that definitely you should need to know. So the vector chaining, the basic idea is, it's basically forwarding. So you have a vector functional unit, let's say an adder, and a multiplier. Vector chaining means that you forward the result uh, of the previous element in the vector to the adder. So let's say you have a vector uh, add that feeds into this vector multiply. If you don't have chaining, this vector add needs to finish in its full vector length uh, before this multiply can start. So let's say your vector length is uh, 50. You need to finish the entire 50 elements of vector add before you can start the multiply. But that doesn't make sense because each element of the vector is independent. Right? So uh, the idea of vector chaining is whenever you finish the first element, let's say uh, you're adding a0 to b0, and then what you have is a1, b1, and dot, dot, dot going up. Whenever you finish a0 to b0, forward the data to the multiplier. Uh, let's say this is, this is what you're doing, C, A, B, and vector multiply takes C and multiplies by 2, let's say. You forward the first result, C0, to the multiplier, and that multiply can start on the first element of the vector. Basically, instead of waiting for the entire vector length of this instruction to finish, you supply the elements you forward the, each element in the vector to the next instruction. Now you can overlap the latency of add and multiply. Right? This add effectively takes one cycle. Well, the, the latency of this uh, add. So it takes, let's say, three cycles. If the latency of add is three cycles, you take three cycles to generate the first element. And that first element becomes available to the multiplier right away. That's the idea. Is that clear? So in a sense, it's obvious, right? It's not mm, you just forward the data uh, to the next element, uh, ne next processing unit, so that you don't wait for the entire vector. Sounds like you have more questions. <laughs> what else? We started well. <laughs> Let's do this. I guess this doesn't stay in the presentation mode when you have something other than PowerPoint. Huh? So I guess if you look at the timeline here, uh, what happens is instead of waiting, you, let's say you start uh, this, uh, this, this add takes three cycles. It takes three cycles to add the first element. And let's say you have 50 elements. You have 49 cycles to finish the entire add. If you don't have chaining, the next element multiply can start here. Let's say multiply takes six cycles and then 49 cycles to finish. It's a pipeline multiplier. If you don't have chaining, this is the execution timeline you get. This is for the vector add. 
and this sort of vector multiply. Whereas if you are chaining, you know that this data is available. The first element is available after three cycles. So you can actually start the multiply for that data element right here. Right? So you, have, you overlap the latency of processing in the add and the multiply. And eventually, the number of cycles you will get is you can calculate, right? Three cycles, six cycles, four nine cycles. Does that make sense? An additional hardware cost is usually worth it to do that. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be waiting for the entire week. Yes? Just a quick question. But what, what are the six? What are those six cycles for? Oh, that's what exactly. That, is that? So I assume that that's the latency of the multiply. So that. So uh, it takes three cycles to add to elements, and it takes six cycles to multiply to elements. But then you do it forty. Then you have forty-nine cycles, and that's. Okay. So the first element, uh, let's say C zero times two, takes six cycles. You have a pipeline. Think of this as a six-stage multiplier. The first element, uh, C0 and 2, goes in. Six cycles later, the result comes out. So you get the result of C0 times 2 right here. Now, because it's a pipeline multiplier, while C0 times 2 goes into the pipeline, in the next cycle, you also get C1 and 2. In the next cycle, next cycle, you get C2 and 2. In the next cycle, you get C3 and 2. That's why once uh, C0 times 2 comes out here, and I guess I didn't give a name to it, but let's say X. Once X0 comes out here, the next cycle, X1 comes out. The next cycle, X2 comes out. The next cycle, X3 comes out. So you have 49 of these remaining elements that come out. Because uh, multiplier is pi prime. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This is notation we use in the lectures. That's why I use it. But what else? Vector processing is a good one. You can expect questions on that. Yes. So with regards to run ahead, is there any reason in particular why you don't enter run ahead mode? Well, <coughs> okay, I, was, I guess I was going to ask, do you don't run enter run ahead mode or can you get an L1 cache in this? But that's because you can just go to the L2 cache and don't necessarily have to go to memory. Is that correct? Oh, uh, so that's a good question. That's, that's actually a design choice also. Do you actually enter run ahead on an L1 cache in this? Uh, remember, one of the, uh, you're right, exactly what you said. On an L1 cache miss, you, run ahead needs to be effective. For it to be effective, it needs long latencies, right? Because these long latencies are the ones that stall the processor. Now, if you enter run ahead on an L1 cache miss, that L1 cache miss may hit in the L2 cache. And entering and exiting run ahead has latency, uh, like idle cycles, because you need to flush the pipeline and restore the checkpoint. Now, if you predict that this L1 cache miss will actually also be an L2 cache miss, you may want to do, you may want to enter run ahead mode. But the way we described it in class, we enter on L2 cache miss. But that, even that's a design choice if you, desi if you design a good predictor. The higher level inside, if your latency is short, don't enter run ahead. If your latency is long, enter run ahead. And assuming, assuming that's going to be useful. This is actually also uh, for prefetching as well. We actually prefetch into the L1 cache or L2 cache. You may not want to actually prefetch for short latencies because it may not make a big, uh, it may not give you big benefits if something is going to hit in the L2 cache because our board execution may cover that latency, may tolerate that latency. We may not want to invest in the design of a prefetcher that can tolerate these short latencies. What else? These are good questions. Yes? What do you do with the addresser of 
prefetching is invalid? That's a good question. What does invalid mean? Um, suppose um, it's not, well, suppose it's protected. You don't have privilege to see that data. Oh, it's protected. So when you, uh, normally when you do a prefetch, uh, you also check the TLB. And if you don't have a privilege to access that data, the TLB will tell you you don't have privilege. Right? So the prefetch is canceled. Prefetch is normally canceled in those cases, yes. Because you don't have privilege. Right? And it doesn't generate a fault also, because it's hardware prefetching. I mean, you could alternatively prefetch the data right? but that would be if it's safe. fetchable. But when the processor demands it, then you get the full fault. But if that's the case, then data will be in the cache. That's right. And so uh, a malware could try to exploit that and try to see what's in the cache at that point. Mm -hmm. And this way, it could read like fault, like a detected data from kernel from other processes. That's a good question, but. Uh, if the, if the malware doesn't have access to that data, then it won't be able to read it from the cache also, unless there's a bug in the so uh, processor design, right? So you may load the data, but as long as no one is able to read that, no one not privileged is able to read that, that's, that's fine, right? fun things to think about. There could be questions like this maybe. <laughs> yes? Um, on the example, we got to know any of the specific stuff that we covered about like SIMP scheduling and what we and stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. well, I know a lot of that's like proprietary and video stuff that we never went into in a lot of detail, but there were still all kinds of diagrams and all that mm -hmm. So what, what we've covered about branch divergence, you, you should know about. You remember that, right? But the how, how uh, basically, know, know about what we've covered in the lecture. But beyond that, you don't need to know about. But how, what a warp is, for example, uh, that's important, right? That's fundamental. Yeah, but you had up there like a snippet of coding code. Oh, no, no, you don't, need to, you don't need to know about that. That's just to give you an example of what, what code looks like. Okay. You don't need to know about how to write programs in CUDA. <laughs> That's good for you, but that's not the purpose of uh, this course. But know about the concept of uh, SIMT. What does it mean? What is a warp? Threads that have a common PC, right? Common program counter. When do they diverge? And how is divergence handled? What else? Any other questions? Or I can go back to your question, solve it. <laughs> there should be some more. Or we can go back to the lecture. Or we can leave early. You guys have a choice now. Yes? So 18740 will be online. Okay. Uh, 15740 will be will likely be online also, but we are we're not sure yet. So if you want to uh, take 18740, what uh, what will happen is we'll have online lectures, okay. as well as online plus in-person discussions. I don't know if that answers your question, but. So interaction with, if, if you want to uh, like continue uh, what you've learned, yes. I'd recommend registering for 18740. Okay, for now. 15740 may be a different course. Okay. Uh, the other issues. Because the scheduling is different, right? As you see. Right, yeah. 18740 is, 
It appears to be scheduled to conflict with everything. Okay. <laughs> because it's at three different times across three different days. Okay. Uh, oh, is it that way? I think one of them is at 7 p.m. or so. 7.30. Right. Right. There you go. So the rest those are recitation sessions. Okay. Uh, as, I, as I said, the courses will be online. So pick one. So pick one. I, um, okay. Actually, I, we don't have the website yet. But my suggestion would be pick uh, at least one. So you don't have to attend all of them. Okay. okay? In fact, you don't have to attend any of them. Some of them will be held online. But pick as long as you can make one of those, you're fine. Okay. okay? Yeah, we should probably put a, a website up and tell that. But actually, that should have been up with the course description. But if you if you if you like this material and if you want to continue, just register for that. And some of it will be flexible also, depending on uh, what students we get. Since it's a graduate level course, we can uh, schedule a separate discussion that accommodates everyone also. So this will be an experiment in the hybrid education, online plus offline education together. So you'll be part of that experiment. <laughs> but it should be fun, regardless. Any other questions on the exam? I know you guys know all of the topics that we've covered. Was it covered earlier this lecture? Uh, say it again? Was it covered earlier this lecture? Oh, well, will the exam cover this lecture? Well, some of these concepts are basic. So uh, I'll say no, no prefetchers know how they work. Uh, but you don't need to know everything in this lecture. Okay? Is it cumulative? So it is cumulative, yeah. But again, uh, the focus may, will mainly be on the topics that are after the term one. Okay. So if you look at last uh, last year's midterm one versus midterm two, that should give you a good idea. Last year's midterm two is heavily focused on uh, what's, what was covered after midterm one. No, you have two sheets. Two sheets. Yeah. All right, nice. You can, you can do another one, or you can do it from scratch. What else? Good luck, study hard, and I'll see you Wednesday. Come early to class.